everybody and welcome back to another episode of In The Booth, except we're not in the booth today. Um, we're in an undisclosed location in the GTA area amongst a beautiful collection of cars and probably one of the most beautiful man cave garages I've ever had the pleasure of, 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 of seeing. Um, beautiful, beautiful automobiles all around me. But today we're gonna be focusing on one specific car, a car that we actually plan to do uh, an episode on before delivery. Unfortunately, timing just couldn't allow, so we're coming out here to do it um, on location. Um, so really, really excited to go over this latest car. It's a car that I feel is a defining moment for uh, a specific brand and uh, a car that's helped carry a brand into the future. And of course, a lot of speculation about what the replacement of this car will eventually be. And I'm talking about none other than the McLaren P1. So where can I really start? When McLaren was first introduced uh, as a road car company, when Ron Dennis first announced that they're gonna make road cars, that would have been in the late 2009, early 2010, that we saw that the 12C was coming out and the initial project um, was gonna actually encompass a halo level car, meaning, you know, they're not an entry level because the 12C actually stacked up right up against, you know, 458 at the time and, and cars alike. But there was also going to be a hyper car that they were going to be introducing as well. The timing was working perfectly because Ferrari was already working on LaFerrari and uh, Porsche was already working on 918. So I don't know if that was on purpose or not, but the timing was perfect. 12C launches, things get going. And then I believe it was in Geneva 2013 that we saw the first production example of the McLaren P1. Of course, we saw a design study that was introduced in 2012, uh, but nothing was really talked about with the car, what kind of power you knew it would have. It was just like a, basically a design study. It looked really cool, but you could see that it was slightly unfinished and missing a lot of the cut slits and you know intakes and stuff like that you see on the production level car. In 2013, however, in Geneva, when they introduced that they're gonna make this car, things got really serious. You know, Ron Dennis, obviously a man of, um, you know, great stature, you know, the guy is uh, a legend level in terms of what he did with McLaren, bringing it to the forefront in the early 80s and, and producing it into the company that we really see today. When he made remarks regarding the P1, it kind of wasn't really like the stuff you had heard before. If we really go back into the lineage of the hypercar, I would say that after the F4959 generation cars, they really became more about exotic material, exotic design, exotic engines, kind of pieced together, you know, some of them based off of, you know, expired uh, race car attempts and, uh, and the like. If you really look back at like F50 generation, if you look at the, uh, you know, Carrera GT, let's say, again, all great cars in their own right, but not necessarily benchmark cars in terms of performance. And I think that created a little bit of a laziness amongst that, that, that sort of segment. Most of those cars were beautiful to look at, but they didn't really deliver on track. They really didn't bring a new level of performance. They might've been faster than the uh, regular supercar range that they had, and they should be. They had, you know, on average, 100 more horsepower, and they weighed like maybe, you know, two to 300 pounds less than those cars. But they didn't really, really push it to a whole new level. Ron Dennis made very, very strong remarks. He was like, this is, the car is gonna do the Nürburgring in less than seven minutes. And I believe that when that happened, if you look at the timeline of 918 and LaFerrari, those cars actually ended up being a little delayed. I believe those cars were delayed because they needed to go back to the drawing board. They knew they had an extravagant design. They had this beautiful, their beautiful engines. They were all going hybrid, but how much they really concentrate on the performance aspect of what the car was gonna deliver. McLaren already had their carbon tub technology already sorted out with the 12C. And there is a lot of similarity underneath this car to the 12C. And nobody's gonna hide behind that because that's just the way it is. 
And if you look at the rest of them, they also kind of do the same thing. I would say the 918 is separate of that, but as we all know, the LaFerrari chassis was all basically built off of 458. So all these things are still kind of present. But the P1, they really did hone in. I think to this day, the McLaren P1 is the best execution of McLaren. Now, new product is starting to catch up to that. But as you go through a lot of the um, overlays that Matt's gonna toss on this video, you're gonna see a lot of the finishings of the P1 and just bringing it to that next level. But enough about finishings, we'll talk about that in a bit. Right now, we're gonna talk about what the car was able to do. So let's start with powertrain. In order to deliver the ultimate performance, the MA38T engine needed to go through quite a bit. The entire casting of the block was changed, pistons, rods, all that stuff was beefed up, cylinder heads are changed, cams are changed, and if you see the two hair dryers on this thing, meaning turbochargers, they're massive. The hot side is very big, giving you a lot, a lot of high-end horsepower, and the cold side or compressor side is also quite large. But they didn't really have to worry about moving the power band so high because the trick comes from the electric motor. Combine those two pieces, give this thing 903 horsepower. 177 of those horsepower being delivered by the electric motor. But more than horsepower, it's the torque fill situation that really makes this car drive very special. Of course, with McLaren aiming to push the power band and the turbocharged compressed air to match the high revving cam as this thing pulls 8,500 RPM, they needed to fill the bottom up. Because sometimes it's not all about how much a car can accelerate as fast as possible. It's about how much in that rev range the car can accelerate as fast as possible. So instead of having 2,500 RPM of full force, this thing has more like 5,000 RPM of full force. And that's where the edge comes from. And you can see the way, you know, Porsche delivered power with the 918 was kind of similar. Ferrari's a little bit different. Ferrari's was a system that would just carry through with the RPMs. In fact, maybe on the weaker side. A lot of people argue that the Ferrari has more outright speed, but it actually doesn't. In fact, in almost every test and drag race you put the, against each other, the P1 always pulls away. From there, they are actually also able to engineer this thing to drive on full electric power. The 918 was able to do that, the LaFerrari wasn't. This one here can do about 10 kilometers on all electric power. I know it's a little minuscule, but hey, you know what? If you're getting home late at night and you don't want anybody to hear you, you're gonna be able to get away with that at least. I always love that feature about this car and it's actually something that's carried over the Artura, which is our new hybrid electric supercar and that thing does the same thing except it delivers you 30 kilometers which is amazing but going back to the p1 the power unit in here has been incredible super dependable lots of power and just absolutely beautiful sound the best thing i do love about the way the ma38 tq engine in this car is it still retains the iron exhaust manifolds to the turbochargers, which still gives it that baritone style, original 12C rumbling sound. Obviously this one plumbed into one pipe coming out the exterior, which, uh, which actually changes the sound a bit, but the bassy, bassy sound of the P1 is like, I couldn't think of anything better to match that with the slight whistle from the electric drive engine that accompanies it. It really does create for a very exotic sounding car and it just sounds very powerful. It has a bit of a Night Industries 2000, if you know what I mean, if you're, that, if you're old enough, but the, the car from, from Knight Rider, it has a bit of that actual sound to it, which I think is awesome. Moving to the chassis of the P1, that's where things got really serious. Of course, McLaren with their pioneering proactive chassis system, they took a next level on the P1. They gave it ride height changes. And ride height changes, well, you know, we all love that because if you look at every supercar in history or any car in history, nothing looks better than a car that's hammered down to the ground. The advantage that the McLaren P1 had was race mode. Go through the sequence in the cabin, 
activate race mode, the car slams down to the right height you see it at right now. The rear wing extends out. So, so, so tall. Almost, actually, center line with a roof. In position to gather so much air. This thing fully adjustable. And of course, down over here, you have some adjustable suspension, sorry, adjustable arrow that's just underneath here as well. But before I go to the arrow, the suspension system, super trick. Obviously, no sway bars in this one as well, just like the 12C and all the uh, super series cars from McLaren. Everything is decided by hydrodynamics, which operate lightning speed. The way they're able to achieve these lightning speed calculations and adjustments to the suspension is through these massive accumulators that they've installed at all four corners of the car. So the hydraulic pressure is built, gathered, and put on reserve. So as soon as the car pitches, rolls, on the brakes, on the power, everything is circulating through the suspension system to give the car ultimate grip and ultimate flatness at all times. Because the best way to get around the racetrack is to not interrupt the weight of the vehicle. You don't want it tossing around side to side, left to right, front to back. You want it to be in the middle all the time. And that's how the suspension system on the P1 was able to really achieve great, great levels of downforce by bringing the body really, really low, but still maintaining the ride height even across the car, even under certain circumstances. Of course, there is always gonna be some movement, as you can see a lot of the videos when Chris Harris was hustling the car around Abu Dhabi and when the car was being driven by McLaren's test driver at the time around the Nürburgring. <laughs> bottoming out and sparks flying out the rear and just creating a beautiful beautiful you know situation on camera for us all to absorb and like drool over just an exciting exciting power to be put through a suspension system as trick as this <laughs> but then it didn't end there then we get to the best part when looking at a hypercar on paper or in a magazine there's always gonna be something, you know, that holds you back a little bit, you know? Um, I will say that McLarens maybe don't photograph as well as they look in person to me. When I first saw the P1, the images were the car was not in its super lower mode. It was a little bit awkward looking because it was so futuristic looking, but the ride height was kind of interrupting it for me. Of course, you go through you know, the process, you know, we were going through the specking process with some of our initial customers. Um, and you know what I mean? You're finding the right way to sort of build the car. Luckily enough, I got to go to Monterey in 2013 and I got to saw, see a finished product car. And when I saw it slam down the wing up in position, I was like, oh my God, I can go crazy on this thing. I'm super, super blessed that I was able to spec two P1s in my career, front to back. And uh, both those cars are still in Canada, which is great. One of them is out west, and the other one is uh, right here in Toronto in another uh, undisclosed uh, collection in the GTA. When I first saw the P1, the first thing that came to my mind was how small it is. And size is what really matters in this particular segment, at least for me. When you build a car or hypercar or supercar, I find that a lot of manufacturers like to go in the, in the direction of making the car bigger to make it seem like it has more status, to make it seem like it's bolder. Um, I'm not even sure. I think those are most of what the actual, I think that's the most of what their actual thinking is. Whereas McLaren sticks to their guns and their roots and all they really care about is making this thing as efficient as possible in terms of aerodynamic, packaging the car as small as possible and making sure they can reduce weight and reduce unnecessary material that surrounds this entire package. The car is tiny, 903 horsepower packed into this tiny, tiny little low thing. If you put a Ferrari 458 next to this car, it will look humongous. And that to me is what makes the P1 the ultimate out of all of them. The LaFerrari, even bigger, just a, a boat of a car, to be honest. And then of course the 918, although has a, a, a nice denseness to it, it is also a very, very big car. 
Looking at the P1 from the front, you can just see that this car was designed in the wind tunnel. Air hitting this car, feeding these high temp radiators right up front here, sorry, low temp radiators up front here, pulling it through. We have two fans just in here, pulling the air out, exhausting it, using it and guiding it over top of the, over top of the car. Most of this with the slits on the hood will guide the air right down into this area over here. The most trick and beautiful piece of the P1 is its doors. The multi-piece door is just incredible. It takes in air down here, feeding the high temp, super thick rads. You gotta see the rads that are under here. If you ever get a chance to see a P1 with the clamshell off, it is a sight to behold. You got these massive, massive high temp, high pressure rads here. Their cores are like this thick, they're massive. Just sitting tall all the way down, feeding air into this area. Additional air being fed in this way over here and then capturing more air guiding along here. And just back here, we got another little intake that is gonna feed a little bit of the air box and turbochargers. The side slits down over here, designed to take air pressure out of the wheel while housing, exhaust it as fast as possible. They want this air to come be circulated in here and exhaust out as soon as possible. When they exhaust it, they capture it again. They run it along the side over here, creating additional levels of downforce and making sure there's a bit of a, almost like a wall that's created of air, which will prevent air from getting under the car because that's the enemy. You want no air under the car. You want all the air to be around the car, over top of the car, and you want to create big suction levels under the car so that it pulls it down even further at speed. Going over top, you'll see it kind of guide over and the beautiful and most perfectly executed roof scoop I think of any McLaren ever, including the McLaren F1. This one to me is the best. This beautifully incorporated snorkel, it fits so nicely and cut out amongst the doors. It feeds right in here. This feeds the two main air boxes to the uh, turbochargers along with these quarter glass little scoops that we have over here. Sucking all that air in, feeding the turbochargers, creating boost, and then of course propelling the car. Up top over here, we have these gorgeous McLaren speed marks that have been carved into the rear quarter panels. As air rushes over top, these feed both engine and transmission oil coolers on either side. So again, lots of cooling systems all around the car that are helping with the gearbox, AC system, the engine system, um, you know what I mean? Oil system, like there's just so many different things. Even cooling the hydraulic fluids. Once all that stuff has been entered in, we then now have to get rid of it. With the engine temperature system here with the Inconel exhaust system that the P1 has, we have this beautiful, gorgeous aluminum piece that goes over top, surrounded by the McLaren badging. And this here helps to exhaust all the, all the heat from the exhaust system uh, as it really, really warms up. You got twin catalytic converters that are helping to hone this thing for, for um, efficiency and, uh, and environmental issues. And, and that stuff there is working really, really hard just underneath here and it's got to, it, the, the, the heat's got to exhaust somewhere. So these vents create a beautiful, beautiful trickle of air as you see the car running up to temperature. Really, really sexy. Of course, then leading down to the massive, massive rear wing. The wing on the P1, I think, is probably one of the most well-executed pieces and elements I've ever seen. It is the closest thing to real Formula One I think you'll ever really get to. When you look at the design, the way it's so fluid and organic looking, this is the real stuff that I think is designed in the wind tunnel to really provide the best level of performance. Attach that to aeronautic grade hydraulics, as you see over here. These pieces here, are actually so lightning fast in adjustment. Like you probably will not even see it. It will almost look like it's broken. It's moving so quickly. Under massive load and driving stresses, this thing can cope with so much. You can see the big fat rods all hydraulically actuated. They extend out of the bodywork. These pieces actually go all the way down to the bottom of the car. If you take the floor off, they're almost sitting on the floor. The hydraulics pull the system up actuate the wing, get it into its best position for aerodynamics and for downforce, and then they will stay in that position. Once you get onto the straight, 
You can press the DRS button and I-pass buttons that are select on, on, on the steering wheel. This is gonna give you an extra boost of electric power and it's gonna actually position this wing in a stall position so that it's giving you the most fluid, 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 least amount of downforce possible. They just want the car to be able to accelerate as soon as possible as fast as possible as soon as you're about to pitch in that corner you'll lift off the thr throttle or go on the brakes and this thing will go right back into position and when i'm not talking it like moving like like this or like that we're talking about like it's that that quick it's really really incredible to see it in action it's probably my favorite feature of the p1 as well like just that rig right there the level of work engineering and and and, and finishing that I need to go into this and make it work in the real world survive under circumstances we're not being used that much you know that's the trick and i love all the paneling and all the fasteners that sort of hold this stuff all together back here it really looks like formula one grade stuff if you get close to the bodywork of a formula one car it's almost exactly the same as this and the last piece of the puzzle is the braking system the akibono braking system that you find on the p1 is another first it's newer technologies to the brake disc. As you can see, there's no perforations in the rotor like you see in other conventional ceramic brakes. This system was designed to dissipate heat and create a new level of braking performance. Of course, as with most McLarens, the braking system is a place where they concentrate a lot. Big power and big brakes. And that is a way to make up tremendous time on the racetrack. Of course, the aero is a huge part of that, but nothing's better than when you can be on the power for longer because you can depend on the braking system that will stop you in a shorter distance. That's more time to accelerate. The Ekebono system on this car is beautiful. If you see it from underneath, you see all the guide beams that lead to the front of the vehicle to help cool the system. These beautiful snorkel type pieces on the rear which apply a little bit more cooling effect to the rear brakes as the rear brakes are acting as the differential for the engine as well, for the, sorry, for the uh, drive as well. The uh, P1 incorporates a open diff gearbox, no different than the 12C. So that's super critical that when the car is going under high load situations and the, not traction control system, but the system itself is trying to just keep the car, moment, the rear wheels and momentum evenly, this system really comes into play to make sure the, cool, the braking system does not overheat. The brakes are incredible. So all those things encompassed, there's not one element of the P1 that is missing. But the one thing that the P1 has over top of any of the other cars that have ever come out from McLaren, and this includes the Senna, because the Senna's ideology is a little bit different. One can't discount the level of finishings of the P1. When you look at the Senna, the Senna has a, as I've explained in one of the earlier videos we've done on the show, it has more of an F40 thing to it. It's not really designed to fit and finish that well. You know, the uh, carbon tub is kind of unfinished as you look at it. It's really just designed to be super lightweight, super high downforce, brute power, and deliver the most uninterrupted driving experience. The P1 is a bit different. The P1 is a road car first, and they've always said that. Of course, it's gonna deliver on the racetracks, it's gonna do all that stuff. But part of the entire thing was to be mesmerized by the exotic materials, the things we were talking about earlier. It still has to look the part. So when you see the way the carbon tub is finished, this fine carbon fiber weave, we can see the thicker carbon fiber weave which makes up the bulk of the actual tub that you sit in. Beautifully finished, constructed, and finished in gloss all around. None of this stuff is just kind of pieced together, glued together like it is on the Senna. It had to look great. When you look up into the A pillars, you see these beautiful pieces, and you even have the vents incorporated in these carbon fiber sections that allow for the HVAC system and heating system to work. The beautiful P1 buckets are simplistic and hold you right in. You look towards the center and you see the rainfall of this beautiful component here, which houses the iris system of the P1 and everything is just so beautifully executed. It's probably touch wise and feel wise, the best P McLaren to be produced until the Artura. 
The Tura actually is, I would say, of this level in terms of fit, finish, touch, feel. Over the last four years, we've been very active with P1. I believe that we've sold about six or seven in the pre-owned market over these last four years to prominent customers such as the uh, you know place we're in right now. We're lucky enough to source this car out of California from a single owner, finished in fire black. It really looks the part. Black is a great color for the P1, probably one of my favorite, but fi fire orange is also very beautiful because once this thing's out in the sun, you just see some beautiful orange almost flaming through the black paint. It's a very, very beautiful finish. Aside from that, this one is opted with all the exterior components and carbon fiber, including both rear wing elements, the side door section, stealth wheels, stealth finisher over the engine, and stealth exhaust pipe out the rear. There really wasn't that many things to do with a McLaren P1 when you spec'd it, other than some interior trim colors and choice. This one here, very clean with the, uh, with the deviated red stitch tying in with the red calipers. Very simple, nothing over the top. Of course, since now with MSO, you know, you can do all kinds of cool stuff with this car. You can send it back for a full carbon fiber body uh, upgrade. You know, you can do all exposed, you can do different finishes, you can do different interior, you can add gloss to the inside, all kinds of neat things that you can do through MSO with the car now. And that's one thing I love about McLaren. You know, it's very, very custom uh, levels of, of, of offerings that they have, even for vehicles that aren't even produced anymore. Not a, lot of, uh, not a lot of other manufacturers touch that area, but I love that MSO still does. In fact, they even still do it, the SLR. Another upgrade that's due for the P1, which has just been introduced actually, is there's a new battery technology that you can install in this car. It does change characteristics of how the vehicle behaves and drives, but this newer battery, which is lighter weight, delivers more efficiency, um, is actually available now. As you know, P1s went through a bit of a funky area where battery issues were, were, were kind of like holding the car back from being the ultimate, ultimate thing. Of course, McLaren being a small manufacturer, there's always going to be these little things that sort of come up. But this new battery program is great value, comes with warranty, and increases the performance of your car. So for me, it's like spending money to make your car a little bit more reliable and tune it up a little bit. The one thing you do lose with that package is though, is it, it, you will lose the electric drive, like the singular electric drive mode that this car has. Kind of sucks, but I don't know. I guess you got to weigh, weigh the uh, pros and cons and or maybe just wait as long as possible. I know that our client here has decided to keep this car the original way. So that kind of concludes my love affair with the P1. You know, a car that I think reset everything. Everybody tries, everybody tries to make something really, really special, but they never really execute i think the way this car did the mission was clear we're going to build the fastest car ever they went up against porsche they went up against ferrari these guys have been making road cars for who knows how long versus these guys and they came out and they beat them basically every test that the p1 has put up against the 918 and the la ferrari it won it won in almost every category and if you see Every journalist driving the car, you can see the difference in their, in their faces and their psychology when they're talking about the car. They're clearly in love with it more than all the rest of them. And for me, with only 375 cars ever made, that's why this is a car you want to get into no matter what the situation is. If it allows you to add it to your collection, you should be looking for one because it really is just the best of those three. Never mind what value is, what market price is, how much it's worth. Because really, when you're buying these cars, you're looking for the best one. And this one is the best one. We'll see you guys next time. Thanks a lot.